Hello and welcome to today's KDP Universities at Home with Jonathan Moeller. I'm Tricia and for the past five years, I've moved around Amazon's books teams, learning the business so I can share it with authors. Prior to coming to Amazon, I worked as a graphic artist, project manager and educator. But we're here to talk to Jonathan. USA Today bestselling author with over 110 novels to his name, Jonathan Moeller doesn't let genre get in his way. As a matter of fact, he writes in multiple genres, primarily fantasy, but also science fiction, mystery, and nonfiction. Amongst his best-selling titles, you can find the Demon Sold series of sword and sorcery novels, the Tower of Endless Worlds urban fantasy series, the Ghost series about assassin and spy, Kena Amalas, and the Computer Beginner's Guide sequence of computer books. Yeah, you heard that right. Jonathan uses his experience as a computer repairman to write best-selling nonfiction books on, comp on computer technology and has most recently embarked on a new nonfiction project about storytelling and writing a novel. Welcome, Jonathan. Good morning. There Good to go. be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. Sorry, it took my camera a minute to show up. The Love technology. technology. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start by a little bit of history. How did you get into writing? What motivated you to start writing and publishing? I first started trying to write a novel back in high school, and I never quite managed to finish one. And I finally finished writing my first novel uh, my freshman year of college. and. To be honest, I was more interested in that than anything else I happened to be doing at the time. And so I thought, you know, I really enjoy this. And uh, I kept trying to do it and kept trying to uh, get novels traditionally published. And I was able to get two traditionally published with smaller publishers. And the first one, I made a little bit of money from that. The second one, I made just enough that I could buy a Whopper with cheese for lunch one day. <laughs> um, and after that, about it was about 2010 by that point, and I thought, you know, this isn't working very well. Maybe I should, uh, you know, look into doing other things. And then I bought a uh, third generation Kindle because it happened to be on sale for the holiday at the time. And I thought, you know, there has got to be a way to make money using this thing. So I started doing some research, and I discovered uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, and that leads us to where we are today, uh, 11 years later. Gotcha. So. 11 years later, that's a, that's a bit of a time. When did you, we, we hear that people seem to be overnight successes and things like that. You've published over 100 books. When do you feel that you became successful? There's my air quotes. I think it, I first realized I was really on to something in, I'd say September or, yeah, September or October of 2011, because I had a, uh -huh. uh, published my first three uh, Demon Sold novels on uh, KDP. And I would made the uh, first one free because I'd heard some other authors were doing that where you have a long series, you make the first one free, and hopefully enough people enjoy it that they read it and go on to buy um, the second and third and any other books you might have in the series. And I did that and I wasn't expecting very much, but it really started to work. And I thought, wow, I could really be uh, onto something here. So that was the first time I really thought that you know, this whole self-publishing thing could work. And that was uh, 10 years ago now. I think it's uh, this week, uh -huh. actually, that I've been uh, self-publishing for 10 years. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Now, are you still, um, for a lot of authors, they are not full-time authors, right? They they work in a side job or a side job or a main job, either way, mm -hmm. and they write on the side or vice versa. Are you a full-time author or do you have a, a side job? I felt like I was making enough to go uh, full time at about 2012, but I didn't because I really liked my job and I didn't want to quit. Um, but eventually in 2016, I needed to move to another state for family reasons. And at that yeah. point, I decided rather than look for another job, I would just go full time with the writing. So I've been uh, full time with this since the end of uh, 2016. OK. A lot of authors uh, that write in multiple genres use different author names or pen names. Do you publish using different pen names or, uh, or do you just use one author name for all of your titles? I thought about using pen names at various times, but 
and there's some good arguments for doing that where if you write in wildly different genres it's good to have uh, different uh, pen names so that um, it's easier for the various algorithms to boost the books but I eventually decided that'd be too much hassle because then you need separate websites and potentially separate okay. social media accounts and uh, separate newsletters so I decided to you know I'm just gonna stick uh, write anything uh, under my own name and and some of that was a little psychological too where I think if I'm gonna write something and you know put it up on the internet for the whole world to see I should be brave enough to attach my name to it so I have kept with uh, one writer name the entire time oh wow so what challenges you just mentioned that you know some people feel that it's easier um, to market if they're under different pen names what challenges have you found with marketing um, very diverse genres to be honest, I haven't found that many challenges, and um, there's actually been a few advantages to it as well. Um, okay. I'd say the first advantage is most of my novels are um, science, fantasy and science fiction. Okay. Um, as of last month, I've published 119 novels now, and of them, 118 are uh, fantasy and science fiction. And fantasy and science fiction are kind of like right next door to each other in terms of uh, genre. So it's not that um, hard to market both of them since you get some people who overlap a bit. Um, some people, you know, refuse to read any science fiction or any fantasy, but not that many. And there's quite a bit of overlap. Um, I'd say the other advantage is, is it makes uh, paid advertising a little easier because, as I'm sure many people listening to this know, a lot of advertising is based around targets where, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a fantasy book, you, you know, target readers of J.R.R. Tolkien. If you have a science fiction book, you uh, target readers of uh Isaac Asimov or Robert Heinlein or so forth. And if you have like a lot of fantasy books, you can sometimes run out of authors to target and you kind of have to limit yourself to what you're advertising. But if you're right. in multiple genres, um, you can, you know, advertise the fantasy books to one author, the science fiction books to a different author and the nonfiction books uh, based on topic preference as opposed to author. So there's, there's actually been a couple of advantages to it. And I wouldn't say there are a huge amount of disadvantages to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, good. Um, so talking about, do you have multiple, um, let's talk a little bit about newsletters. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have a newsletter? I do have a newsletter. I'm up to about uh, 10,700 subscribers that I've sort of accumulated organically over the last 10 years. Gotcha. So when you send out your newsletter, do you have your newsletter list segmented so that you're not sending nonfiction to your fiction readers um i don't actually have a non-fiction newsletter i keep meaning to get around to making one um for my okay. fiction newsletter i've never really tried to segment it yet and i just use it to announce okay. uh, new fiction one thing i do want to uh -huh. do is i want to write more mystery novels and that's um mm. far enough from science fiction and fantasy that i think it'd be a good idea to have a separate newsletter because when i mm -hmm. published a mystery novel i had a lot of people say i've Known, been known you as a writer for years, but you finally wrote something without wizards, so I'm going to give it a try now. <laughs> so, so I think uh, science fiction and fantasy are far enough from mystery that it would be a good idea to uh, have a separate newsletter. So when I do write the second mystery novel, I will set up a separate newsletter for that genre. So what drives you to write in multiple genres? I think for some authors, they're like, this is my comfort zone. I love writing you know, science fiction or I love writing fantasy, but you're so diverse. What drives that? I write things that I enjoy reading, and I read a lot of fantasy novels, I read a lot of science fiction novels, and I read um, a lot of fantasy and thriller novels, too. Mm -hmm. And so eventually, if you read enough in a specific genre, you should you do tend to wind up enjoying uh, writing in that particular genre, um, which is why I always tell people you should uh, try to write in uh, genres you enjoy, because if you try to pick a genre you don't enjoy, uh, that's like, you know, hot to market. Um, you, right. I think that'll show through your writing and, and the book won't do very well. So I, I write in genres that I enjoy. Gotcha. Let's talk a little bit about your um, nonfiction journey. Um, so you write primarily computer you know how to how to use a computer novels is that an accurate statement yeah of i have a grand total of 10 nonfiction books now and nine of them are on various computer topics so i, I i'd say that's a 90 percent accurate statement <laughs> okay <laughs> what are the challenges of writing nonfiction versus fiction i think with nonfiction, there are 
two key questions you need to ask yourself before you write a book, at least the way I, I've done it. There, there's you know uh, many different ways to write nonfiction, but this is the approach that's worked for me. I think the first question you need to ask yourself is what problem will this book solve for people? Because is like, how do I do this in Linux or how do I do graphic design or how do I learn basic carpentry? And then if you can write a book that um, answers that question and answers it in an informative and useful way, then you essentially have the built-in market is the people who are looking for that uh, answer to that question. Like my mm -hmm. best-selling nonfiction book would be the Linux Command Line Beginner's Guide. And occasionally I get some mild criticism from people like this information is very basic and it's all available for free on the internet. Like you can go on YouTube or the online documentation and read it. And my response uh -huh. to this is there's always people who are going to learn to need, need to learn this topic for the first time and it, they could be benefit from having a structured approach to learning it because right. if you're approaching something brand new you have no basis for evaluating information and whether or not it's useful for it to you so i think uh my Linux book help meet, meets that need where it offers a sort of framework for beginning to learn the topic. The second question I ask myself, and one that is particularly relevant to computer books, is how evergreen is this topic? Because uh, one of the downsides of writing technology books is that the technology changes quite frequently, and so sometimes it can be a challenge to um, keep it updated. And I imagine authors in other nonfiction areas uh, sometimes have that problem as well. Like if you're for example, writing a book on uh, basic tax law that is going to change right. every year and sometimes more than once a year. So keeping it updated can be a challenge. And I think one of the reasons right. my Linux uh, command line book has done so well for me and for readers is because the basic structure of you know the Linux command line hasn't really changed all that much for um, several mm -hmm. decades in terms of the basic commands. So it's uh, I, I accidentally stumbled onto an evergreen topic. <laughs> So talking about stumbling into this, uh, do you have an education background or something like that that helped? Um, because I, I think to your point, one of the things you brought up was that when you're doing education, um, knowing your target audience and doing that step by step beginner's approach is really helpful. So do you have an education background that helped you format um, that uh, discussion or the, the book? No, it, it's actually an interesting story how I got into technical writing. My background, my college degree was in European history. And I had this idea that I was going to you know, get a master's and a PhD and then become a uh, professor, except I got to graduate school and really didn't enjoy the experience. And um, mm -hmm. this was about the time of you know, the big housing crash uh, in the last decade. Mm -hmm. And the job market for academia looked pretty bleak. And like, I, I really don't want to continue with this. And I definitely don't want to go into massive mm -hmm. debt to do it. So I wound up right. going into um, IT instead, specifically help desk and technical support, which I really enjoyed. And I got to work with some great people while I was uh, doing it. And so I spent a lot of time um, you know, explaining technical things and writing documentation and so forth. And uh, towards uh, the end of 2008, um, I had a website for my books and a blog where, you know, I tried to promote the two books I'd had published to very little success. And a new version of Ubuntu Linux came out uh, that year and I wrote um, a post explaining a problem I was having with the uh, file sharing server included with it. And I saw right away that that next day of the post had gotten like, you know, 65 organic Google hits. So I thought, hey, there might be something to this. So I started a blog um, devoted to, uh, you know, technical problems. And at its peak uh, in like 2010, I was getting like 100,000 page views a month, which uh, is better than I expected, you know, you know, nothing compared to like the really big sites, but, you know, considering it was just me, that was pretty impressive. And so then when um, I discovered KDP in 2011, I thought maybe I could turn some of this content into uh, eBooks, which I could then sell. So that's how I got mm -hmm. onto the uh, path of writing nonfiction. Gotcha. Now you recently wrote a book about writing, mm -hmm. correct? That is correct. So let's talk about that a little bit. What prompted you to to write that? I, I assume you found another problem that you could help solve. I did. I was thinking about um, why some people have uh, negative reactions to the endings of, you know, like long running TV series or long running mm -hmm. books 
or like long running movie series where there's all this build up and then in the last season or the last movie, uh, the audience just seems to uh, turn on it. And I was thinking the problem may have been that these uh, movies, books and TV shows were not following uh, basic story structure, because I do think uh, in terms of successful stories, there are there's a you know basic structure you have to follow, like you know, in grade school, um, in, you know, literature class, you learn about, you know, the basic, you know, outline of a short story, you know, introduction, rising action, climax, and resolution, and so forth. And so I thought it might be useful to beginning writers to write out um, an example of what I thought, you know, an explanation of what I thought was a good story structure. And then at the end of the book, include a copy of one of my shorter books where I could uh, point out like here's an example of what I did in terms of story structure and then you can judge for yourself whether you thought it worked or not. How's the reception been for that book? It's been pretty good. Um, I've gotten some emails from people um, saying that they found it helpful as they were writing books. There aren't too many reviews on it yet, but I found that for okay. nonfiction books, the reviews tend to gradually accumulate over time rather than appearing in big spikes. Um, like, mm -hmm. you know, my Linux and Windows books have a couple hundred reviews each, but they've been up for sale for um, almost 10 years now. So this uh, mm -hmm. sort of thing can take a while to build up. Gotcha. Um, let's talk a little bit about your marketing strategy. Um, and from what you mentioned, it doesn't seem like there's a huge difference in a market in your marketing strategy for your nonfiction and your fiction. Can, so can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, for new books, uh, new f novels, what I generally do is um, I found over experience that if you're publishing a book on Amazon, the, in terms of visibility, it tends to reward more steady sales instead of you know low sales, low sales, massive spike, and then low sales again. So I try to spread mm -hmm. it out um, a bit. What I usually do is when I publish a new novel is on the first day, I will uh, just let it sit and not do anything. On the second day, I will put up uh, a link on my website and change the latest book section of my website to a link to that. Uh, the third day, um, I will post it on social media, on my social media accounts. And then the fourth day, I will send out to my newsletter, which usually generates the biggest sales spike. And I found mm -hmm. that does a pretty good job of spreading it out over a couple of days and getting a, a good boost in terms of uh, how long it remains visible on the store. Mm -hmm. uh, for my older books, my favorite tactic over the last 10 years, and I've tried different things, and this is always the most reliable and the most steady, is when I have a long series, I make the first book free, the second book 99 cents, and the remainder of the books in the series full price. And then I just mm -hmm. advertise the first free book a lot. Um, it works really well as a loss leader. And then it's very easy to calculate the uh, profit loss on the um, on the ads because then you look at how much you spent on the ad for the month and then did the entire series make more money than the ad and if it did you turn a profit okay so let's talk about that first first in series free and this is a um, a theory that I, I heard this is um, other authors use this as well but some mm -hmm. of them do that by placing the the book in Kindle Unlimited other people are wide and then they they just um, do a price matching. What what do you do? Are you in Kindle Unlimited or are you wide? I am mostly wide at the moment. Um, I've been in and out of Kindle Unlimited since it came along. And I think at my mm -hmm. least wide point, I was still about, I did the math well back, I was about 78% uh, uh, wide, which is a passing grade at most universities. Um, <laughs> but I think for Kindle Unlimited, what I found the best and most effective was where I had box sets where I had a really long series and then the first three books were bundled into a box set and then I would lower the price of the box set to like 99 cents and then advertise that heavily and that I mm -hmm. uh, had the advantage of generating a lot of page reads because these box reads would be like um, around 1200 to 1500 KENP in terms of page count so you mm -hmm. could make up the money on the page count that you would lose on the 99 cents sales and you would make up even more money on uh, if people like the box that they go on to read the rest of the series and then you would get uh, ebook sales and uh, page reads from that. Do you ever find any pushback for the, the first book free and then they have to, you know, 99 cents and all of a sudden they're paying full price or, you know, having it in KU and then having to purchase the rest of the series? 
Um, yes, less than you might think, though. I think the easiest way to avoid that, I mean, no matter what you do, you're always going to get some complaints. But I think the easiest way to do that is to have a complete story without a cliffhanger in the first free book. Because it, one thing that will absolutely turn off practically every reader is if you have a, a free cliffhanger followed by a, uh, a paid uh, sequel, because that looks like, a, you know, practically an extortion attempt. You know, like, uh, if you want to find out what happens to this character next, whip out your credit card. Um, but I do think if you can have a complete story with, you know, no cliffhangers as your first free book, that will go a long way towards um, easing uh, any re reader resentment because you know readers are pretty smart they know that uh, you know the author me needs to make money too and if they right. read the entire you know first book and enjoyed it and thought you know it might be worthwhile to uh, uh, spend money on the additional sequels then uh, then that can work so we we talked a little bit so the box sets do you put all of your series in box sets or is it just select ones that are mature and possibly complete Usually what I've done in the past is if once I get to like the fifth book or possibly the sixth book and then I'll make the first one free and then bundle the first three together in a box set. Um, if it's just a trilogy, um, there's not really much of a reason to do a box set unless you have a sequel series, which I do for uh, mm -hmm. one of my trilogies. Uh, but once I've gotten to the fifth book and usually my series tend to be about nine to 15 books, depending on uh, how long the story is. Then once I get to the fifth book, that's a good time to make the first book free and do a box set of the first three books. Okay. How long does it take you to write a series of that length? That's a lot of books. It is a lot of books. Um, my longest series was my Frostborn series, and that was mm -hmm. 15 books. And I started that in mid-2013, and I finished that in summer 2017, so about four years. Um, okay. Shorter series would take less time, obviously. Um, it, lately, uh, I've had the problem where I've had too many different series uh, going on at the same time, so I'm trying to, you know, bring some of them to a close before I uh, start a new one. But there's always the weakness of the writer where you have a long project ahead of you and send something, the new project pops into your head and it's like, ooh, shiny, and then you wind yeah. up chasing that. <laughs> so speaking of that, how many books do you release a year? I usually do between 10 and 12. Um, I, I try to do one a month, which isn't always possible because sometimes if a book gets really long, um, it'll slip over into uh, writing longer. And if there's, you know, stuff in real life that takes up time, that can uh, set you back yeah. in terms of production schedule as well. But I usually try to do uh, something once a month. So what's your day look like if you're releasing once a month? Well, I uh, get up, I exercise, and then I come back. Um, I usually then uh, write till lunch, and then after lunch, um, I will check email and check ads and do anything um, that needs to be doing in terms of the writing business, like you know, adjusting ads or uh, emailing people back, that kind of thing. Then I will write till dinner. I'll make dinner, and then the evenings I prefer to have as uh, family time and avoiding uh, any work in that time unless it's really urgent. Gotcha. Um, so, You've mentioned Amazon ads a few times, mm -hmm. um, and we've heard a lot of different strategies in this series over what's your strategy for working with ads? We, you talked a little bit about, you know, you advertise, you make the first free, and then if your total series made money, it was a success. But can, mm -hmm. I think it's a little more involved than that. So can we break that down just a little bit more? I've had a lot better luck with nonfiction on Amazon ads than I've had with fiction. Um, I've used uh, Facebook ads and BookBub ads for uh, fiction uh, with pretty consistently successful results, but I've mm -hmm. never really been able to get Amazon ads to click for fiction. But I've had very okay. good luck with uh, nonfiction because I, I think the targeting is easier because you can look for uh, subject matter instead of um, um, author because for fiction you really need to target author because you target genre like for example if you're writing romance books and you target you know romance as a keyword the bidding for that keyword is just insanely high and even for you know epic fantasy or science fiction the bidding for those keywords can be in like the you know two to three dollar range consistently right. um, so for fiction what you need to do is you know target you know um, author is at about uh, your level or maybe a little smaller and then just go through targeting 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 until you um, uh, get a good match. And I've never really been able to get that to work. But for nonfiction, it's easier because you can uh, target your uh, 
topic matter and variations on your topic matter, like you know Linux or Linux command line, Linux for desktop, Linux for servers, mm -hmm. and so forth. Because people do search for those uh, terms pretty frequently, and then mm -hmm. it's much easier to get a uh, reasonable cost per click and then uh, turn a profit from people actually buying the books. Okay. Um, sorry, I just lost my thought there for a second. <laughs> Okay. I do that all the time. Uh, let's, <laughs> it's it's a uh, part of getting old for me. <laughs> um, you know, they say memory's worse to go. Uh, with your social media, can we talk a little bit about that? You mentioned Facebook. Do you do anything else besides Facebook for social media? I do Facebook and Twitter, and I've um, had much better success on Facebook than I have Twitter. Um, you know, I've had a Twitter account since like 2009, and I've never really been able to get my head around the platform. So what I usually do is, um, you know, just post links to things like, okay, this is done, or I've written a good blog post. Uh, there we go. I think um, the key to Twitter is that you really have to engage a lot and, um, you know, retweet and, you know, chat with people. And it mm -hmm. always says, uh, seemed like my time is better spent, you know, writing the next book instead of, you know, uh, talking to people on Twitter because most of the people who follow me want the next book. They don't want conversations on Twitter. Um, I think uh -huh. Facebook, I've had an easier time because uh, it, it tends to be more graphically oriented. And if you have a good mm -hmm. picture and, you know, an interesting but short post, you can get better engagement on Facebook. So I've, I've had better luck with Facebook than with Twitter. Have you done, so talk about formats. Um, I'm assuming you're, you know, paperback and ebook. Do you also do audiobook? Yes. Um, as of right now, I believe I have 48 audio titles. Um, and let me do some math in my head quick. Uh, nine of them are from Podium Publishing, five of them are from Tantor, and the rest were uh, self produced by me. Okay. Um, what are the the best things about doing that you said that you produced yourself what are the best things about producing yourself versus going through a service the best things about producing yourself are that the uh, money is better um, you have creative control and um, there are more marketing options available to you in terms of uh, how you can promote them the downside of course is you have to pay for it yourself and that can be uh, prohibitively expensive. And I don't do audio books regularly. Um, I do them if I have uh, you know a couple of months that goes well, and I'm looking towards uh, next year's taxes. And I think if I use uh, some of the the revenue from the last few months as audiobook production, that can be used as a deduction. And then that's also a, a new uh, asset I can sell that uh, readers will enjoy or listeners will enjoy in this case. So that's usually been my approach to audiobooks. Do you find that when you have um, audiobooks as well as print and ebook, it makes marketing them easier or there's more avenues for marketing? Yes, because it helps recover the cost of the ad because um, if you you can go a little higher on how much the ad costs if uh, people are also buying the print book and the audiobook in addition to the ebook because that helps offset the cost of the ad and it just makes the book generally look better on the store where if you mm -hmm. go to the page and you say hey it's available in ebook paperback hardback audiobook and you know other formats that makes it look uh, you know better and more professional generally uh, do you have a team you mentioned the fact that with social media you, you want to spend your time writing rather than talking on Twitter do you have a team that you work with maybe publishers you know cover artists editors um, I have some cover artists I've worked with, and I've had a pretty good relationship with them. I have uh, the narrators I work with as well, um, since obviously I don't want to be narrating my audiobooks myself. Um, but for most things, I, I do myself, if at all possible, just to you know keep things simple and uh, keep costs down. So if it's possible for me to do it myself, I will mm -hmm. generally try to do it myself until I realize it's a bad idea and I should probably hire someone to do it. But for the most part, I try to do things myself. Okay. Um, so you mentioned the fact that you have cover artists that you work with. How do you find your cover artists? Um, recommendations for the most part. Um, my very first cover artist, I was uh, 
corresponding with uh, another author uh, named uh, William King, actually, who um, I think is most well known for his uh, Warhammer novels. And then he got into self-publishing over the last decade. And I really liked some of the covers for his self-published books. And I emailed him and asked, hey, where'd you get these covers? And he told me. And so then I you know, emailed his cover artist and we've uh, done many to covers together since. Other than that, I watch for you know book covers I like. And then if I like a book cover, I'll look inside the book and see if it includes credit to the cover artist and if it does I will go to their site and see um, what their rates are and you know how far in advance they're booked because that, that is sometimes a challenge because the really good cover artists sometimes you need to book them like seven eight months in advance if not more. How do you work with a cover artist to, to get your vision on the cover? Do you give them free reign and like they read the book and then they tell you what they think the cover should be or do you have a synopsis? How does that work? I generally don't think it's reasonable to expect the cover artist to have read the book because, you know, the really busy ones can do like 100, 200 covers a year, and that's a lot of books to read. So what will usually happen is the cover designer, especially the more experienced one, will uh, give you a document that's called uh, the brief, and then they'll have you fill the brief out in terms of what the title is, uh, what the genre is, and uh, what sort of elements you want on the cover. And for that, I think it's important for um, a lot of writers to remember that the cover doesn't necessarily have to be super accurate in terms of what is inside the book. Um, the most important thing for the cover is to indicate what genre it is. Like if you um, pick up a book and um, you know the cover has you know a guy in a cowboy hat, you know, gay, lovingly gazing into the eyes of a woman, and you open it up and it's a fantasy novel with you know orcs and elves, the readers might be very disappointed because the genre expectation has been betrayed. So I think that's the most important thing um, for cover design is that it accurately reflects reflects the uh, genre and what the book is going to be about. Mm -hmm. Do you have a specific brand look that you typically have on your cover? Some art, some authors will use the same font for their name or the same font for their title. Is that something that you do? Only across series. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things with uh, cover design is that the series look has to be really consistent across the series to indicate that, you know, okay, this is another book in the series. Other than that, no, not really. And I personally think that might be a hindrance when you're writing as many genres as I do, where um, something that looked cool and really stylized on a science fiction cover wouldn't work on a fantasy book and definitely wouldn't work on a mystery or a nonfiction book. How do you decide what will work in each genre? What what elements do you usually look for? Um, it's a good idea to scan like the top 100 or so on the Amazon store in terms of what's selling in your genre. And you will notice a very consistent look for different genres. Um, ideally, you want you know, a thumbnail to immediately indicate that this is a fantasy novel or this is a science fiction novel or whatever. Um, like you'll notice that science fiction, you'll have a lot of um, scenes of spaceships shooting at each other over planets and so forth. Uh, fantasy novels will have a lot of uh, dragons or you know, knights fighting each other or maybe some orcs. Um, urban fantasy will generally have a woman in a leather jacket with you know, glowing lights around her hands, that kind of thing. So as long as the, the cover um, reflects the genre appropriately, I think you're in the ballpark so to speak. <laughs> um, the other question that comes up frequently is about the description or the title on your detail page. How do you determine an effective title and then from that, because right, you, you use advertising to get people to your Amazon mm -hmm. page. Once you get them there, the next step is to get them to buy the book. Uh, exactly. What are the tactics that you use on um, for your metadata or your um, detail page that works for you? I think what I try to do generally is try to have a consistent name across the series. Um, a couple times I've done that, you know, very, uh, very blatantly where the book's title is named is like Frostborn, the Grey Knight, or Frostborn, the Eightfold Knife, and then you, it's very obvious across the series that um, the title is the same. Uh, for descriptions, um, I think generally the shorter and punchier, the better. Um, obviously, there's some disagreement about this, and there's right. I think there are a couple of different good ways you can uh, do descriptions. Where if you have longer descriptions, um, you know, there's a good way to do that. But for myself, for fiction, I prefer uh, shorter and punchier ones. Where if you can keep it like under 150 words and make it mm -hmm. as short and punchy and um, 
as compelling as possible. I think that's the best way to do that. And I've done that with you know greater or lesser uh, success as I've tried it. Um, for nonfiction, I just I generally start with a question like, do you want to learn the Linux command line? Do you want to learn how to do this? And then uh, lay out very clearly what the book is going to be about. Like maybe give a one line summary of like five or six chapters. Like you know learn how to um, set up a compelling introduction to your novel. Learn how to make interesting characters and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The next thing that we get a lot of questions about are keywords and categories. I think that everybody kind of struggles with that in the beginning. Uh, how do you determine which categories you put your books in? What's interesting is for my Frostborn series, when I started writing that in, when I started playing that in 2012, which story I started writing in 2013, I was trying to decide what uh, category to put it in. And I decided to put it in the Arthurian category uh, because it was relatively not heavily populated at that time and to feel justified doing that i did write uh, uh, an arthurian element into the story where um, the characters were descended from people who escaped the fall of king arthur's kingdom and so he was part of their you know history and uh, legends um, mm -hmm. for nowadays um it's you know all the categories are generally uh, more crowded um, but i think mm -hmm. the best idea is to find the least crowded category you can that is still appropriate to your book um, if you're moving way outside your category that's generally a bad thing is going to turn people off and i think you might get into trouble with the store at some point too where a couple times i've seen um you know i was looking at like the bestseller list for linux books and it's like linux books linux book shirtless guy linux books linux book uh, going down the list so you could see that someone had the not so bright idea to try to boost their sales by putting their book into a totally inappropriate category for it um so that is something i think you should avoid but so long as you mm -hmm. um feel justified that your story has like you know a science fiction element or a fantasy element then you should probably try to find the least competitive category you can and then put the book in that category because i think that would help with visibility Right. And, and to your point, I, I think the disappointing customer experience will show up in your reviews if you have it in the wrong category. Oh, 100%. <laughs> what about keywords? How do you determine effective keywords for each of your books? It is easier for nonfiction than it is for fiction, mm -hmm. I've found, because with nonfiction, you can uh, keep to a subject matter and then use okay. the seven keyword slots to fill out, you know, items related to your subject matter, whether it's Linux or computers or whatever nonfiction topic you're uh, talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And if you use ads, Amazon ads to promote the nonfiction book, you can later go adjust the uh, keywords to, you know, keyword matches you're getting in the ads, where if you notice a lot of people are uh, buying your book after searching for Linux for beginners in the ad console, you can go back to the uh, metadata fields and change your keywords to that. Uh, mm -hmm. For fiction, what I've generally done is um, there's that chart in the KDP help pages where if you put in this these keywords, they'll take you to these categories. And generally, um, that's what I've done. Uh, Make sure mm -hmm. just use the keyword fields to get into the categories I want with the addition of um, my name and the series title as well. Since I've noticed with ads, a lot of searches seem to come from people searching for a combination of my name and the series title. Okay. I think that's a great call out that I don't think we've heard before is to use the Amazon advertising um, keywords that are hitting for your keywords um, in your title setup. That's a great tip. Yeah, that I, I have found that does help refine um, both the ads and the keywords for the uh, book as well. And then hopefully you get them working together and sort of a nice synergy. How much time do you spend researching uh, versus writing? That is the tricky part for nonfiction, why I've written so much more fiction um, than nonfiction, because fiction is less work. You can just make stuff up. And so long as it, you know, works in the context of the story, you can get away with it. This is not true with nonfiction. Um, so when I do write a, you know, like a computer book, I will make sure I test everything and make sure it works on the current version before I publish the computer book. Um, mm -hmm. The storytelling book was a little easier in that regard since the only research i had to do for that was when i use something as an example like i'd say like this uh novel from 40 years ago is a good example of story structure to double back and check to make sure that the novel actually happened the way i'm remembering it because i read it like 15 years ago and i didn't want to uh, cite it incorrectly as a good example of story structure right right <laughs> um 
What about proofreading and editing? Is that something you do yourself or do you have editors that work with you? Um, I do the first pass myself. Um, what I've done is I have a Kindle Fire tablet and that has the built-in text-to-speech feature, which is uh, very useful. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I'll put the book on the Kindle Fire after I've done the first editing pass and then have it read aloud the book to me. Um, and that is very good for catching typos or sentences that don't make sense or, um, you know, clunky sentences or if you, you know, drop a period or a there, the par paragraph is flowed together. It's also really good for spotting formatting errors that you might not uh, notice otherwise. Um, for proofreaders, when I started out, I worked with a couple of paid proofreaders, but it didn't really work out. Um, and so since then, uh, both my wife and my mom have helped me with uh, proofreading at various times as uh, their schedules allow, and they've both been uh, very helpful with that and have really helped me uh, cut down on the number of typos. So the downside is no matter how much you spend on proofreading, no matter how many people help you, there's always going to be at least one typo that gets through and someone will email you about it. <laughs> but that's the good thing. You know, they email you, you change it, and you upload a new file. That That's one of the nice things about uh, self-publishing is it's um, there's not many mistakes you can make that are permanent that you can't go back and fix. I mean, it might be a bit of work to fix, but you can mm -hmm. uh, go back and fix it and get an improved version. Yeah. Uh, we have a question about the content of your newsletter. What do you can what do you include in your newsletters? And then how what's your frequency of sending newsletters? What I've been doing for the last uh, nine years or so is I was trying to look for ways to improve click through rates. And so what I started doing was I would write a short story and uh, give it away to my newsletter subscribers in the newsletter. Um, first through uh, Smashwords coupon codes. And then later um, when Kindle Unlimited came along, I would sometimes do free days on short stories with Kindle Unlimited. Mm -hmm. And then when BookFunnel came along, I would just, that made it very easy to uh, use a link. Um, I, I found it's hard to make money using short stories, but I do enjoy writing them. I do enjoy the form. So usually when I release a new novel, I will, if time permits, write a short story to accompany it and then give it away for free to my newsletter subscribers. And that really helps uh, drive click through. Um, for a while in 2019, I thought, eh, this is too much work, so I'm going to stop. And then, you know, my click through rate, you know, went through the floor and like, well, nope, better go back and do this again. Uh, in terms of structure of newsletter, what I usually do is, um, I found this is very helpful is at the top, I include the unsubscribe link right away because mm -hmm. people get very uh, touchy about their email inboxes, sometimes get, you know, mortally offended if your newsletter shows up in them. And so it's very useful to have uh, the unsubscribe link right at top at your newsletter. And then that way, if um, they're unhappy, they'll just unsubscribe right away and won't send an abuse report to your uh, mail account provider. Um, I know some people don't like doing that, but it's better to have, you know, a smaller list with people who actually want to be on it than opposed to a large list with uh, people who don't want to be on it and will complain. Right. After that, I have, um, you know, the link to the new book I just released. I usually try to, you know, put the cover art there and then all the store links and then the links to um, the free short story and then the links to usually something else I promote. It usually be like my latest audio book, um, my previous book, or sometimes um, if I've asked other authors for newsletter swaps, that's where I'll pay them back by putting their book in the, that part of the newsletter next to the free short story so everybody sees it. Mm hmm uh, you just mentioned writing short stories on top of the releasing a full novel every or full book every um, month. How many words do you write a day? Lately, I've been averaging about um, 7,000 or so. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year was a little faster because we we had you know the first wave of all the lockdowns and stuff, and there's nothing else to do. Right. So that year, I had a whole string of. Uh, you know, 10,000 word days that I'd never had before. But this year I've, I've been a little slower, but I'm still doing about uh, 7,000 words a day or so. All right. Um, we have a question about the finding authors uh, that are similar to you. So you mentioned that one of the things you do with the, the Amazon advertising for your, um, your fiction is finding authors that write in similar genres or similar topics. How do you find those authors? I found the easiest way to start with is the uh, also bought sections on the Amazon store page um, that mm -hmm. has you know moved around quite a bit in recent years. But I found you can get to it pretty consistently if you open a tab in incognito mode and go to the store page that way. And then usually the also bots for your book will show up there. And that's a good place. Um, if you have a 
author central profile um, and you go onto that page on the store, then in the left hand column, there's that links of people who bought your book, also bought books by, and that's a good place to start. And then finally, after your books have been around for a while, um, you can go to Goodreads and um, I, I really think Goodreads is uh, more for readers and not for writers. So I don't, you know, they'll post their comment there very often, but it is useful to go to your book and then you can look in the right hand column and see readers also enjoyed books by, and that is also a good source of finding books that um, um, would be close to yours. Good tip. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Do you write all the books in your series before you release them? Do you release them one at a time? Do you release, a, you know, like, will you do a quick release for three books? How do you do that? No, I definitely write them one at a time and then release them one at a time, which, which um, annoys people. I wouldn't say it annoys many people, it annoys a minority of people because there's a okay. unfortunate tradition, especially in fantasy, where long series tend to peter out and not get finished. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll release the books one at a time. Um, for something like Frostborn, which was like 15 books that took four years to write, that would have been uh, unworkable to write them all and then release right. them. The only time I've tried to do rapid release was when I wrote my uh, Silent Order science fiction series. And um, I wrote the first five books over the course of a year and then released them uh, one week at a time and it worked well but i i don't think the results were work worth the extra work i put in to write them over a year so ever since then i've released a book at one at a time as soon as it's ready to go do you find that readers in um any of the genres that you write in um are more apt to binge read rather than wait for the next novel i think they're the readers in all genres are equally apt to binge read um i've had uh, people who say i discovered your you know, first free book and then run, went on to read the rest of the 15 in the next month, which is always very flattering. But I do think uh, binge reading is um, very common across all genres. All right. Um, so we have a question. Um, you got into self-publishing in the early days uh, and then gained traction when there was less competition. Do you have any advice for authors entering KDP now? Is it harder to gain traction in 2021 than it was in 2011? I think it's a little harder, but not insurmountable. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I have the advantage of, uh, I initially was traditionally published. I remember the way the traditionally published uh, system worked and self-publishing is so much better. So um, that's my baseline of comparison, uh, comparison to it so it's always like this is great compared to traditional publishing um i do think it's a little harder but it's not insurmountable um for one thing the tools now are so much better um there's so much more mm -hmm. software and um there's some and you know a lot of it is free too like uh, kindle create which you can get for free from amazon is really an excellent piece of software and there's nothing like it in uh, 2010 2011. so i think it's a little harder to get traction but by no means insurmountable um, uh -huh. Like my Tower of Endless World series, I've never really promoted it in um, any way because I think it's a bit of a odd duck. I'm always grateful when readers read it and enjoy it, but um, I've never really tried to promote it hard. Um, but a couple months ago, the first Firma Free did 42 copies of downloads without me doing anything. And then from that, mm -hmm. it generated 17 uh, sales of the second book, and that's without any advertising or me mentioning it anywhere. So I do think it's still possible to uh, get traction, even if it's not quite as easy as it was in 2011. Um, what do you think, if you had to advise a brand new author to learn one, one thing with self-publishing, what would it be? Or the first that thing, a anyway. question. Um, I don't think you can stop with just learning one thing, like I'm going to learn this one thing and then um, be done with it. I think the the one thing uh, to start with you should learn is how to finish your book uh, because um, a lot of writers get into the trap of they'll start a book and then get bored and you know try to do something else or finish a book and then get really self-critical and you know try to send it round after round of beta readers and never work up the confidence to uh, publish it um there's a great great quote from uh, steve jobs that i always use in this you know, real artist ship so at some point you have to say the book is done i have finished it i am putting it out into the world and then i'm going to start the next one so i, I think mm -hmm. finishing is the most important skill to learn when you are just starting out okay uh so are you a plotter or a pantser do you plot oh, out your plotter. story? Uh, definitely plotter. Um, I 
start by writing a synopsis that's usually about a thousand to two thousand words long and then i chop it into uh, suitable chapters and then i um you know start writing the chapters that said i do tend to improvise a lot uh while i'm writing um uh -huh. i usually like sometimes i'll change a character's name uh one time i changed the character's name like five minutes before i published a book um and sometimes i'll you know invent new subplots along the way. I compare it to like, you know, say you want to drive from like Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles across the United States. That's a very long drive and you will be better served if you have a map and a route planned out instead of, you know, trying yeah. to, you know, find your way manually and accidentally winding up in Canada or Mexico by mistake. Um, but while you're driving, you might find that, you know, a bridge is out or a specific freeway is out or there's a better route available. So that's usually how I compare my process. I'm definitely a plotter, but along the way, sometimes I'll change my mind and think, okay, this would be a better idea and then do that. Do you distribute um, in books, in bookstores, like, um, so with KDP, there's the opportunity to enroll in expanded distribution, which makes your books available to bookstores. Do you do that or do you publish through other publishers to to do that? I've always put my books into expanded distribution, first through CreateSpace and then through a KDP print. I know there uh -huh. are other methods of doing that, but I really haven't had the time to ex explore them, which is, you know, one of the uh, downsides of doing most things myself is that yeah. uh, I kind of need to focus on the biggest priority, which is, you know, writing the next book and then exploring other avenues as there's time. But the the fact is there's always more opportunities than there are time. So sometimes you have to let things uh, go by the wayside to focus on more important things or the most important things. Right. Uh, we have a question about how you built up your newsletter base. What I have done since the beginning is I include um, a link at the end of the book saying, I usually include two links at the end of my book. It's first one is to a page on my website where I'll eventually post the store links for the next book in the series. And then the second link is for immediate notification of new releases when this book comes out, uh, click on this link to sign up to my newsletter. And at first I just had the sign up form, but as I you know, time went on and I started observing best practices that other authors were doing. I eventually mm -hmm. realized that it would be a good idea to do a giveaway. So as I built up more and more novels, I eventually set up uh, three of my shorter novels that I give away for free to anyone who subscribes to my newsletter. And I've had pretty good results with that. I have um, tried uh, Facebook lead generation ads and I've had mixed results. Um, it's like usually like the first week or so is good and you get good results and then the cost per click sort of shoots through the roof. So I've experimented mm -hmm. with them in the past and I'll probably experiment with them again at some point in the future, but not right now. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about updating a book. Um, can you, let's talk about that just a little bit. Do you do updates to your book content uh, frequently or just when you find a typo or have you ever gone back in and rewritten a section based on reviews? Um, I've never rewritten uh, a section uh, based on reviews. I always have the attitude, uh, this is the book I have written. You know, if you like it, okay. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, but this is the book I have written. Um, when I get typo right. reports, I do go back and fix those right away because that, you know, results in an improved uh -huh. reader experience. Other than that, the big update I do is when, like I've written the fifth book in the series, and then when I publish the sixth book in the series, I'll go back and add the first chapter of the sixth book to the end of the fifth book as a means of uh, helping mm -hmm. to pull people into the next book. The only big rewrite I've done is um, my mystery novel. Um, I originally published that in 2011 and never really uh, gained traction. And then this year I decided to redesign the cover and uh, republish it as a new edition to see if it would you know, generate sales. And uh, the only thing mm -hmm. I changed was I changed the uh, date the story took place because I thought it would work better in uh, 2007 instead of 2008. So that's only been the major, mm -hmm. one major republishing thing I've done. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier, we talked a little bit about Kindle Create. Do you format your own interior? And if so, do you use that tool or something else? Yes. Uh, when I started uh, long enough ago, I predated uh, Kindle Create. So initially I used uh, free programs. I used a uh, free EPUB editor, editor called Sigil, which I still use pretty frequently because it lets you see the underlying HTML code, which is very right. helpful. And then I'd use another free program called Caliber to convert it to uh, Mobi. Um, since then, um, I've a couple of years ago, I switched to Vellum, which is a 
very good but more expensive option for the Mac. Yeah. And I've been using that for ebook and uh, print formatting ever since. But uh, you mm -hmm. don't have to necessarily uh, buy Vellum, even though I recommend it quite a bit because there are many good free options available that will do the job. Yeah, and to your point, um, just we're getting some questions. Uh, Kindle Create is a free downloadable tool through KDP uh, that you can use on both um, Mac and um, Microsoft products uh, to format your interior of your book. So that's what that is. Yes, and unlike um, uh, Vellum, you can get Kindle Create for both Mac and PC. Right, right. All right. What um, we mentioned a little bit, we talked a little bit about publishing in audio, and we've gotten some questions around kind of um, is it cost prohibitive to publish in audio? It, it can be very cost prohibitive to uh, publish in audio um, because narrators um, can be quite expensive. Um, I believe the, uh, you know, for narrators who are a member of the, you know, Screen Actors Guild and need to maintain their membership, mm -hmm. I think the baseline they need to charge is 250 per finished hour, um, which, you know, sounds expensive, but there's really a whole lot of work that goes into um, uh, that finished hour, so it's not um, expensive. Um, on ACX, the exclusive contract used to be for uh, seven years, and I think that's not unreasonable in terms of thinking how long it you can expect to take to recover the cost of the audiobook. Um, uh -huh. So I would, you know, I've enjoyed the audiobooks I've done, and um, you know, I've worked with some really wonderful narrators. But for most authors, I think you need to think really carefully whether you want to do an audiobook or not, in terms of whether it'd be uh, cost per cost per effective and whether or not it'd be a good use of your money. Mm -hmm. And um, ACX is the um, Amazon's um, self-publishing for audiobooks, um, so you can check that out at acx.com. Um, what, so, uh, publishing once, going back to that publishing once a month, which I'm still in awe of, uh, what kind of word count do all of your books have? I actually figured that out a while back when I passed, uh, the 110th book. It, the longest book I've ever written was 145,000 words, but that was kind of an outlier. And the shortest book I ever wrote came to like 41,000, but that was also kind of an outlier. I think about 40,000 uh -huh. words is the absolute minimum you can have for a novel. But my average tends to be, my official average based on the, the math was like 87,100 words per book. But I try to usually land for about 90,000 to 100,000 words per book. Okay, so not short books. No, not short books. I, I found that it's easier to sell longer books than uh, shorter ones, because uh -huh. um, you, you sometimes see writers get excited about the idea of serials or writing, you know, short books mm -hmm. like they did back in the 1930s. But I, I think uh, short books at that time period were sort of an artifact of, uh, you know, paper prices back during the 1930s. Right. And so I think the expectation for most readers nowadays is that books will generally be a bit longer, though that can vary by genre, of course. Okay. Uh, we've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, so we we mentioned wide versus um, Kindle Unlimited, and I just wanted to clarify what that means. So wide means that you're publishing your ebook in um, outside of Kindle Direct Publishing, and then Kindle Unlimited is a, a subscription. Well, it's Kindle KDP Select is the author facing for Kindle Unlimited, and Kindle Unlimited is that subscription service. Um, Real quick, do you also publish in other languages? Not at the moment. Um, I'm not opposed to the idea, and I would like to explore that at some point, but I haven't been able to investigate it. And it's also part of a cost issue because, you know, a good translation, like a good translation that will not offend the readers of that language can be very expensive. Um, so if I was going to do translations, I would probably uh, start in German because that's where I've had, I've seen the most other self-published authors have success, but it's not something uh -huh. I've had uh, time to explore very much, unfortunately. Okay. Well, we are at time. This hour went very, very quickly. It did. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing this knowledge with us. A lot of great tips. Appreciate well, it. Was my pleasure. I hope uh, people find it uh, enjoyative and informative. Excellent. All right. For all of you who joined us today, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And as always, happy publishing, everyone.